let's just take a moment. We have sung, and it has been so good to raise our voices to Almighty God. We have sung together and, and, and gained strength from being alongside each other. But let's take a moment before we, before we come to God's word just to rest, to rest in his presence. to prepare our hearts to be before the gift of his word. And so Holy Spirit, I ask you to move in our hearts to prepare us for the beauty of your word. May we hear your voice, may we receive. Lord, would you help me to speak? Would you strengthen me when I am weak? You are strong. Come, Holy Spirit, in your gentle presence, undertake and carry us this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you, if you haven't already taken your seats, please, please do take your seats. Um, this evening we are starting a new series and it's called Finding God in the hard places. And I'm sure in a room full like this, there's not very many of us who have not been in hard places or are in hard places this evening. And we are starting to look at that by looking, taking a hard look at that place of loss. And to look at that subject of loss, we're going to be in the book of Ruth this evening. So what I'd love you to do, the, the first chapter will be up on the screen because we're going to read the first chapter together. But if you would like to get it out, um, it's page 222 um, in, in the blue Bibles. And I'm asking you to do that because as we look at this subject of loss, we're going to do something that I have never done before. So do you all feel nervous? I know Clive's already nervous because we've already talked about this. <laughs> What I'm going to try and do this evening as we look at loss is I'm going to try and preach the whole book of Ruth. It's only four chapters, but you know me by now, so I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, so why I have asked you to get the Bible out is because I might need you to, to dip in and out. We'll read the first chapter, but we will dip in and out of uh, the other chapters as we go. So let's start by reading, say, the first chapter, because this chapter, I mean, the very first words of any book are very, very important. So, and within this chapter too, we see two um, of the responses uh, that we're going to look at um, as we look at law. So let's, let's read this first chapter of the book of Ruth together. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. 
Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried, and may the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned together with Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see, sometimes when we take a, a book out of the Bible, we tend to just drop into it. Take this book of, of Ruth, this story of Ruth and Naomi and the other characters and see it in isolation. Just seeing the characters in the immediacy of their story and their relationship to each other. But what we need to notice um, is the very first verse in this first chapter because this sets the scene and it says it gives us a clue what life was like it says in the days when the judges ruled and that should immediately uh, alert us to the cultural context and take us to a very famous verse from one of the most sordid times in the history of the Israelite nation because Judges describes how we've come through the Exodus, we've come through uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, and they have arrived in to the promised land, gifted to them by God. And what do they do? Like teenagers in the face of the parental advice of God, who has quite clearly set out to them 
what are the promises for obedience and what are the consequences of disobedience. And what do they do? They throw caution to the wind, this free from the shackles of slavery and the wilderness. The very last book in Judges says, or the very last verse in Judges says, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a verse often used to describe our own day. But this is the context of and the beginning of Naomi's and Ruth's loss because we see that there was famine hit Bethlehem and Naomi and, and her family headed off to where there was food um, out of the promised land and in to Moab. And that word might not mean very much to us, but for an, an Israelite, Moab was held up as an, as an extreme negative case of foreigners to be avoided at all costs. The, the origins of this nation came from the incest between Lot and one of his daughters when they fled Sodom and Gomorrah. The Moabites tried to bring curses on the Israelite nation as they journeyed through the wilderness. They worshiped foreign gods. They practiced child sacrifice. And Israelite law actually banned any sort of uh, intercourse with the Moabites, either social, religious, or sexual. But this is where Elimelech takes his wife and his two sons. And when they get to Moab, we read that tragedy hits and we have the first loss because Elimelech dies and Naomi is left in this very precarious position of being a widow, and of, but of being a widow in a foreign land. And it's probably that that necessitated her sons to find wives so that they could have sons. But we read that even after 10 years, no sons have been birthed. And then bringing loss upon loss, both of Naomi's sons died. And in this culture, this was a cataclysmic disaster for these three women. Now we might, we might not like it today, but with no men around, that meant a loss of status, identity, reputation, income, protection. And this is where when we come to this ancient book, way at the beginning of the Old Testament, how ancient uh, widowhood in biblical times can speak to all of us. Because I wonder, have you ever lost? Have you ever lost something? Have you ever lost a spouse, a child, a relationship, a job, your home, your reputation, your health, your dignity, your purpose? And I want to see if I can push it just a little bit further because as we look at loss and, and look to apply this book to our own lives, I wonder have you ever looked at yourself um, metaphorically or even stood and looked yourself in the eye in, in the mirror and have you felt that sense of, you know, that you're just less than you should be, that you're less than you could be. And I want to say to you that that is the haunting sense of the loss of glory. The loss of glory that each one of us was created to have. The loss of glory that was there in the garden. So each one of us face loss from one degree to another. And so when we look at Naomi and Ruth, her Moabitess daughter-in-law, this for them, and these words may be very familiar to you this evening, this for them is depression, this is darkness, this is the end of the road. And this is what necessitates Naomi's desire to return home to Bethlehem. And this is where I hear the, very, the first echo of 
the New Testament, as it describes there in verse 19 of chapter one, that the whole village is stirred as the women ask, is this Naomi? And I just wonder, because I think people are people no matter what century you live in or where you go, but I wonder might some have, some of those women been delighting in a little bit of gossip. Here comes Naomi, empty handed, and she's got a Moabitess daughter-in-law to boot. So I think there is a little tinge, a little tinge, not completely, but a tinge of the return of the prodigal son. And I don't think it's too much of a, a stretch to say that there are, she, there are shades of shame in Naomi's return and bearing her loss before her kindred. Now, we don't know if Naomi protested to Elimelech about leaving Bethlehem to go to Moab. We don't even know if she protested or even thought, I wonder, should my sons get Moabite wives or not? We don't know whether she even encouraged it because she thought, well, we'll not be going back to Bethlehem, so nobody will ever know. Um, but what we do see in this return of Naomi is how loss brings a sense of drowning to the soul. And maybe you feel that as you look into your own loss. A drowning of the soul and a, and a stripping naked of yourself before your kith and kin and before God Almighty himself. And it's here that we see in the face of such loss, uh, there comes such a cry of honesty, a heart's cry of desolation before God. And I think that's the first thing that we take from this, that where there is loss, honesty before God is the best place to start. And we see as we read in that first chapter, she wants to change her name. She wants a name that means that God has dealt bitter, bitterly with her, harshly, that he's brought this calamity on her. But despite the fact that all this happened in Moab, and while she still recognizes in that, that, that heart's cry that, that she went away full, but she came back empty, she still says that it was the Lord that brought her back. And there's something about that honest heart's cry to God. Job did it too. And whether that heart's cry is, because whatever your situation is in loss, whether that heart's cry is to rail at God, is to, to blame him, or whether that is to come and carry your own shame, or whether it is a bit of both. But when you are in that position, of crying out, at least you are in the right position. You are facing the right direction with your loss because you are at his feet. And it is only when you are at his feet that he can comfort you in your loss. Or if needs be, he can gently correct you. It's only when you're at, your feet, at his feet that he can take your clenched fists and your hard hearts and he can open them and he can soften them and he can stand beside you and he can show you grace and he can perhaps, we'll see as this story goes on, show you a different perspective. So Naomi is honest in this first chapter, but we also see another very essential response to loss if we are going to survive its, its suffocating effect on us. And we see this coming from none other than the Moabitess herself. It says that when Orpha left, it says Ruth clung to Naomi. And when loss comes, we need to have something to cling to. And Naomi clings, uh, or Ruth clings to Naomi, and she says those beautiful words, where I go, or where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge. But more significantly for our, our story and our application, she says, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. So in their desperate situation, Ruth is choosing to cling to the Israelite people 
the chosen people. And she's also choosing, she says herself with her own words, she's choosing to cling to Yahweh. Yes, she was the Moabitess, the forbidden foreigner, outsider, but something shifts. Something shifts when an outsider bows before Yahweh and comes to cling. Yahweh is, God is jealously, and I love that fact. He is jealous over his own. But it's an entirely different matter when an outsider wants to become one of his own. And maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you've been coming for weeks. But as we worship and as we sing, you've, you feel something, but you, you know you're an outsider. And I would say to you, the very fact that you're here, that you're in this atmosphere, he is wooing you to choose him. And he delights when you choose to become one of his own, when you come to put yourself at his feet, when you come to put yourself, as we'll read later in this book, under his cloak. And so we see that Ruth clings to Yahweh but she also clings to Naomi physically. And I think there's something in this picture that in the kingdom of God, we also cling to each other. God's purposes for good in the face of loss are actually worked out in how we relate to each other. When we weep with those who weep. And this is what happens from clinging. Um, clinging to Yahweh, because we, when we cling, it's not just a case of holding on to a life raft, but it's taking this word and it's applying it to our lives. There's sometimes when I pray, I pray like this, and it's like a clinging. It's like I just want to squeeze this whole book into my heart. And that's what that clinging, that's what I mean by clinging. It's not just clinging on for dear life because you want everything sorted out. It's a clinging to Yahweh. It's a cling to his way. And when we cling as Ruth did, when we apply the direction of his word, because she would have known the story. She would have heard the story. She might not have had a book or a scroll. They were an oral culture. But she would have heard all about the Exodus. She would have known those, those stories. And when she does that, when she clings to Yahweh and clings to his word and works it out in action, she uses her human agency. That's where we have power to affect things around us. And when she uses her agency, this then blends with the providence of a sovereign God. Ruth shows us that in the face of loss, we still have agency. And by that I mean, we have the God-given intelligence, the God-given wherewithal, God-given reason to respond and to act in, to, in certain situations and to intervene. As God's creatures, we are not called to be passive. So many times I think when we pray, we're asking God to do everything. And it's a bit like whenever they were coming to feed the 5,000 and Jesus said to the disciples, you do it. You know, and sometimes I think as Christians, we want to just stand there and think, Lord, just do it, just do it, you know. It's got nothing to do with me, but it's got everything, everything to do with us because uh, we're not to be passive in this drama of life. This, this world that he's created. We're not just to allow things to happen to us. Because sometimes when we do that, and, and particularly when we face into loss, sometimes that means we can take the path of least resistance and lie down under the weight of that loss and see ourselves as kind of victims to the forces at play in this world. And I, I'm saying that because it maybe seems harsh in the face of loss to say, you know, you've got agency, you can do something. I'm not saying that we don't howl and cry to God. I'm not saying that we pretend that the loss isn't real. 
But I was listening to Rico Tice uh, at the, the Irish Women's Convention last Saturday, and he was saying, he was talking about victimhood as well, and he says, you know, hard times can come, but there shouldn't be a Christian that has self-pity, because we have Jesus. And when Jesus is everything to you, when he's everything to me, no matter what loss we face into, we have everything we need. And we are called and purposed as creative image bearers. And we're called to subdue the chaos around us. We're called to have dominion. We're called to be fruitful. Now we might have to tread a little bit more carefully with that in our fallen state, but that call of God is still the same to every one of his image bearers, which is all of us here. And we see that in what Ruth does next in chapter two. This is where she has agency and she doesn't become a victim in, in being a foreign widow. She takes the Mosaic law, which tells her that she can go and glean it's set out in Leviticus that she can go to the harvest fields and she can glean round the edges. She can pick up what the harvesters have left behind. And when I see this picture, this was the other New Testament uh, story that went off in my head. You know where the Canaanite woman, another foreign woman, comes to Jesus and he, she wants her daughter healed and she, she challenges Jesus with the same kind of rule. Uh, when she asks for her daughter to be healed. And, and I, it's, it's, an, it's an awkward passage to read, and I think the best explanation I have read in a commentary is that the way Jesus speaks to this woman, we, the disciples are beside her, and he's using this woman as an, an object lesson, because what Jesus says to the woman is, but I only came to the children of Israel. And this woman, in her need, in her loss, didn't just shy away. You know, she retorts to Jesus. She said, yes, but even the dogs pick up the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus wasn't offended. I mean, Jesus was delighted with this brass-necked, bold-nerved foreigner who was quite happy to claim the Mosaic law right to his face to get what she needed for her family. And he commends her for her faith. And he grants her request. And so in our story, we see that Ruth does this. Ruth takes hold of the Mosaic law and goes out to glean. And where does she glean? God's providence comes in and blends with her agency. And what do you know? She just happens to glean in the field that belongs to Boaz. And we find out in this intriguing story that Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. And we see in this one action of agency, this gutsy determination not to lie down under her loss and her widowhood, that this sets a chain of events um, off where uh, you have Boaz is called to extravagant generosity and sacrifice. And Naomi is called out of her depression to become one of God's agents herself to bring good out of loss. Boaz is described uh, in chapter two, at the beginning of chapter two, as a worthy man of valor. And this worthy man of valor, this landover, this landowner, um, this man of power and prestige in Bethlehem, he notices this woman in his field. And he asks, who is she? But of course, Bethlehem's all been talking. So somebody's very good with the information as to who she is. And, and he sees this woman working from morning till night. This worthy woman, this commitment that she has to Naomi. And so that makes him respond with grace and mercy. And, and he just, he piles her up with grain to take home. And then he gives her protection. And this is beautiful, right? This is in, in chapter two. So here's this poor foreign widow in Bethlehem and landing in Boaz's field. He notices her 
And then it says in, in verse 14, it says, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Such is the man that Boaz was. And Boaz brings her to the table to eat bread and wine. Now this is not a communion meal, but what we see in this is the foreshadowing of Jesus's invitation to come to his table, his upside down world of where a man serves a woman, which in that culture would have been astounding to watch. A man serves a woman, a gleaner beside the paid workers, a Moabitess dining with the Israelites, the poor included among the rich, the outsider embedded in the inner circle. And none of this, none of this would have happened if Ruth had not taken hold of the Mosaic law or for us to apply it. None of this would have happened if Ruth had not taken hold of the scriptures of God's law and and lived it out and acted it out. But there's even more because not only is is Boaz um, enthused to to respond in mercy, when Ruth returns home, uh, she returns home with this mountain of grain and then the news comes to Naomi that she says, you know, whose field were you in? And uh, Ruth has no idea. She says, well, it was a man called Boaz. And this just lifts Uh, Naomi's depression as she realizes from that first cry where she said that God had forsaken her and she cries out and she realizes that God's mercy has not left her and she says blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead And so we then see that Naomi is revived and she then leaps in to action to pursue mercy for Ruth, to secure Ruth's future. And so what she does is she brings into play the Leverite law of marrying a brother's widow and the Kingsman Redeemer law uh, to secure Elimelech's land. And it's because she sees God's mercy in Boaz's appearance on the scene in chapter three, that then Ruth sends, or Naomi sends Ruth to the threshing floor, to un, un, in the, under the cover of darkness, to watch and to wait for when Boaz lies down to sleep with the other men when the harvest is over. It's quite a plan. And scholars recognize that when we read this, Uh, portion of scripture that as this nighttime encounter unfurls that the language used to to describe it the uncovering of the the feet the the lifting of the cloak that there's a lot of euphemisms there of sexual connotations but what these scholars do say while it while it does and it's very ambiguous as to perhaps what actually happened we have to live with that ambiguity and they would say that the text wants us to live with that ambiguity but what we do need to live with is the facts and the facts that we that we know is that uh, Naomi's motives were true and Naomi's motives were pure. She wanted security. She wanted to show mercy, Hesed, to her daughter-in-law who'd been so faithful to her. And so, and she's sending Ruth off, yes, under the cover of darkness and all that goes with it into the night, but she's sending Ruth to a man who she has every reason to believe will fulfill what the law requires. This is a worthy, honorable man who's not going to exploit the situation. And we also see in the story that both Ruth and Boaz himself have shown godly character, that these are people who live their lives out 
under the gaze of Yahweh. It is only us, I think, Westerners who have been polluted with Hollywood uh, movies that think, aha, something's up here, right? This is not our culture, and we must remember that. So when he lies down and he goes to sleep and he's had a couple of glasses of wine and the harvest's in and life is good, up comes Ruth the Moabitess and she uncovers his feet. And Boaz is startled in the darkness. And he says, who are you? And out of the darkness comes this reply, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. And Boaz, even if he had been bleary-eyed and had a glass of wine in him, he would have known exactly in that culture what that meant, that that was a proposal of marriage. I mean, this book upends everything. I would never have thought of proposing. I think in this culture, we still think, oh, imagine that's in the Old Testament, that this uh, woman came in the dead of night and let this man know that he needed to marry her. The Bible is full of little shocking surprises. Uh, but he would have understood that as a, as a marriage proposal. And again, as you read through that, you see how in his response, um, he is true to his character. And again, he is inspired by her and he exonerates her there and then on the threshing floor, on the threshing floor. And he asks Yahweh to bless her and calls her a worthy woman. Or in some other translations, it says a woman of excellence. You'll see that there in chapter three, verse 10 and 11. And that's the same phrase. He uses the same phrase to describe her in the Hebrew language as he is described in chapter two. And so what I wanted to just hold far a minute here, because if you're starting to hear violins, because as you read through, we don't have time to read through it, but Boaz um, lets her sleep and he's going to do, sort it all out in the morning. And it's kind of looking, isn't this just, like this is just romance, you know, par excellence. But before you hear violins, right? And before you reach for the tissues, um, and you're sensing that this is going to be a happy ever ending, I want to remind you that um, for Boaz to be admired and to be held in such esteem in this culture, and again, it's not like our culture that men would have had um, a number of wives, uh, he would have been married and he would have had other sons. You do not gain respect and standing in that culture if you have not married and produced sons. So to marry Ruth was a sacrifice. And in taking Ruth as his wife to continue Elimelech's name, that would have been eating into his own inheritance. And that's exactly, if you read on, that Boaz says, look, there's somebody else who's a closer man than me. And when that man, they meet at the city gates and they go through the whole legal thing about what to do. And that man says, no, no, you, 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 take, you take the field, you take Ruth, because it would eat into my inheritance. That's the very reason that he gives. So this is not romance, as much as we love romance, but it's not romance. This is the mercy of God in action, working itself out through his image bearers. If you, if, if you read this whole book, you will see that God is not the main character in this. God does not actually speak. But what you find is his image bearers are praying at every opportunity. So Yahweh is front and center, but it is how hesed, how grace and mercy is worked out by his image bearers. And then so we see how redemption comes, that when we come in our loss with honesty, with clinging, with agency, redemption comes. And it spreads rejoicing to the, all of Bethlehem because uh, Boaz does marry Ruth and a son is born. And it was lovely at the beginning of the service tonight because I knew I was gonna be talking about a baby Oh, just to hear a baby's cry. It was, it was beautiful. And again, I want to guard you against that Disney-esque happy ending where wands are waved and 
princesses go to the ball and they find their prince and they get married. Um, because to see this story in that kind of light, it, it trivializes the wounds, trivializes the wounds that these people have suffered, these wounds that these people still carry. And it also trivializes it, um, you know, to sentimentality, that as I said, this, this Western Hollywood sentimentality. And when we do that, it actually blinds us to what God is trying through scripture to teach us. This is not a story about finding a husband and having 2.3 children and having a successful life and God making it all all right for you. Um, don't, don't do that to this profound gospel story. Because at the end of this story, we see that Naomi has a legacy. We see that Ruth has security and safety and a future. What this story teaches us is that this is salvation. This is not sentimentality. Redemption is to be found when lost and empty souls come to the Almighty to receive mercy, surrounded by other image bearers, to be filled beyond what they can imagine. Because I do not, as I draw this to a close, I do not want this to be lost in you. Yes, we're away in the Old Testament uh, and it's Ruth, but don't lose sight of the fact that a baby boy has been born in Bethlehem. That in this oh, little town, a light is shining and God's purposes are being worked out through the responses of ordinary individuals to loss using their agency and God's providence. And they're showing mercy and they're showing sacrifice so that as the carol goes, I know I'm way out of season, but I couldn't help but look up the lyrics so that the hopes and fears of all the years may be met in the birth of another baby boy in Bethlehem. Because this little boy, Obed, who was born to Ruth, Ruth was his mother, Naomi was his grandmother, and this little boy, Obed, is going to be the grandfather of King David. This is the royal line. This is the story and the royal line that brings Jesus to the world, that brings his redemption to all of us. And so we must not look at this story from the vantage point of the Almighty coming into our wee troubles, and they are troubles. When I say wee troubles, I'm not belittling anybody's. We've all got them, I've got them, right? But this is not asking Almighty God to come into our wee troubles and resolve it all and make life perfect for us just for the time that we're here. But what we must do is lift up our losses into his bigger story of redemption. We need to bring our losses to his feet. We need to bring our losses in underneath his cloak. We need to bring our losses to be covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Because God is advancing his kingdom in our days. The kingdom mission continues and he's working it out through our efforts and our responses to what life throws at us. You never know that the battle that you're facing at the minute may turn the tide for the kingdom in a big way. You might not live to see it. Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, they had no idea of the drama that they were caught up in the lineage that they were providing. If we take anything away this evening as we think about this book and we think about our loss, in dark days, the fulfillment of redemption, God is working it out. And may we have eyes to see it 
and nerves for the fight as we face into our loss. 